Very good. Well, welcome. Um, so today is the workshop on the basic neurological examination. So it is guided or designed more towards the first years in the PGY2s, although we will try to go into some tips and tricks, but the idea will not to focus on a particular type of case and focus on examination skills that you will be using on majority of the patients on or a general neurology case. Now, there is a lot of details on how we examine particular subspecialities. So, my examination movement disorder clinic is nothing like a general neurological examination. I hardly do any general neurological examination. I only do segments of it. Um, and, um, uh, and I do a lot more of stuff that we don't do in every patient. So, you know, we have examination for gait, in details, and tremor, and things like that. We will have a separate workshop in the medical simulation uh, center. We're thinking about getting paid actors to be patients so that you guys can be tested. Right there, most of the content is already on the canvas uh, from the last two years. The video recordings are there uh, that you can watch. So the day information is not changing. So what we're thinking is flipping it. So having you watch the examination already and then come in and perform it on a paid actor. Uh, and then uh, get assessed or get a feedback right there on what you're missing or, or, or the additional points. But still a work in progress. So um, idea today is to go back to the roots, go back to a basic neurological examination. Uh, a detailed neurological examination, according to Dr. Torres, takes 72 hours to complete. <laughs> and I don't doubt that. Uh, if you look at any textbook, so my favorite one is uh, the Myers neurological examination. Uh, you will see that it's uh, 350 pages long, 387 I believe. So you will see how much details or information there are in a neurological examination. There are newer and newer methods and tricks and tips that you will discover and many things that don't even make it to the textbook. Um, but there is a reason behind it, right? What's the point of neurological examination or, or any physical examination is to elicit a response to compare it with previous people and see if it is representative of something. If it represents that there is a dysfunction of seventh nerve, and that's why the face is, is loose or, or is fallen out. The problem is that most of the neurological examination has never been validated. It was not designed based on any evidence-based medicine. It was more of a convention. Experts starting doing it, doing it and then those taught them to their uh, students and their students start into their students. So most of the neurology actually has gone from mentor to mentor, you know, or um, chest by chest, uh, teaching one person, teaching the other one. Um, so what I learned, you know, came from Dr. Torres. What Dr. Torres learned came from Dr. Landau. What Dr. Landau learned came from Dr. Merritt. You know, who knows, someone like that, and goes on all the way to Dr. Babinski, and you know, someone who made it up. Uh, or propose that, right? And things keep getting added, and you know, we say that doctors sometimes will teach me something and say, this is Dr. Lindau's sign, because that did not exist before Dr. Lindau. Dr. Lindau made it up and thought that it was useful based on his experiences, and now he's being taught to me, and then I might have something which would be Dr. Torres' sign, because he made it up and nobody else was doing it before. So, you know, that's, that's what a neurological examination is, but the point is very simple that we're trying to isolate something. So, I take an example, I have passion about reflex hammer, and I take an example of reflex hammer to think about neurological examination in perspective. So, the percussion, which is the basics of hammer, started with this concept that uh, if you put water in a barrel, then you can actually percuss the wall and say where the level is. So wine barrels is where the percussion started. And because the barrels were thick oak wood, and uh, fingers are not the most effective way to percuss, they made percussion hammers to percuss the wine barrel side to tell without opening the barrel where the level of the wine is. And the sound change is based on if there's air inside or fluid at any point, and there's a transition point where you can actually tell that's where the level of percussion is. That concept was used when they learned that there was this hydrated disease of the sheep. This is all British. So the sheep were dying and they would open up the brain, it would fill with air fluid levels, pockets in a hydrated disease. And they wanted to tell before opening the brain if there is fluid levels in the brain or air fluid uh, levels. So they started using the wine barrel percussion hammers. So it used to be a hammer and a cup 
put it on the skull of the sheep and tap that and see if there is a sound suggesting there is hydrated disease of the sheep. And that's how the percussion actually started in neurology for the brain, not for the chest. And that one was taken over for by the chest and by, by the belly and abdomen, but it was the brain and it was practical for the farmers to use it in you know, 16th, 17th century on their sheep. But then it evolved. We started using better and better hammer. The first concept of reflex hammer or reflexes was actually a New York neurologist. Um, you know, his name slipped me right now, but um, not very well known guy. But he proposed that you can actually strike a, hand, a tendon or a muscle and the muscle twitches and that's a sign that there's a normal reflex arc. It was 1920s. Or the idea has come from Dr. Babinski earlier, but Dr. Babinski uh, was more about superficial reflexes, the skin reflexes, like the Babinski reflex for the toes that we do, or the abdominal cutaneous reflex that, that they are, not the tendon reflexes, uh, which was proposed uh, 10, 15 years later uh, by this New York neurologist. And then we started using the same hammers initially, but then we started going through these design phase of what is the right hammer to get a reflex, you know, what will get the job done. And there were so many different variations created, most of them actually in America, in, in New York and Philadelphia, uh, were first dedicated reflex hammer for tendon was designed, um, and then the most famous one was also designed soon <coughs> after that, which was the Armstrong hammer or the Tomahawk hammer. So I have some of those, and I try to find those ones and, and collect them. So this is a copy of one of the original design of the hammer, which was designed to get a tendon reflex done, you know, have a very practical design, you know, hammer at the end, it literally looks like a hammer, but it was designed to be top heavy so that you can swing it, have a length and a hole which is flat, not round, so you can swing it between your fingers and let it swing between your fingers. And because the neurologists, as they were practicing these tendon reflex techniques, were realizing, well, we'll get a good reflex, a reliable reflex. What is a good <coughs> reflex? Is that when you say the reflex is present, it's present, and when you say it's absent, it's absent. And that, in, in addition, will have a problem, right? So if a reflex is actually present, absolutely present, how reliably can it say that the arc is normal? Maybe it's 90%, maybe it's 85%, there's no good data. But if you, if there's an added unreliability that you, five people do it and three say it's present, two say it's not present, then that adds another 30% loss of information or 40% loss of information. Now it's, the reliability has gone down to less than 50%. So first you need to perfect your own reliability. That whenever you say it's present, it is present. And whenever you say it's not present, it's not present. And that's why techniques are important. That's why tools are important. That's why positioning is important. All of that is important because you're trying to be as close to gold standard. When you're saying it's present, it's present. When you're saying it's absent, it's absent. And then it has an inherent weakness of whether it translates into neuropathy, radiculopathy, spinal cord injury, brain injury, or not. Uh, that, that's, there is an inherent weakness. You know, how reliable is Babinski sign? There are studies that show the Babinski sign is only positive in 85% of patients with an upper motor neural lesion and is false negative in 30% you know, of patients who do not have an upper motor neuron lesion, and, and so on and so forth. So even Babinski, which we think of as a 100% gold standard, is not gold standard, it's you know, 70 to 85%. But many of those studies are done by non-neurologists, so that's that. Um, so uh, I, oh, I, I found this one of the older designs. This is one of, also the original design for Delphia, the wood handle was actually the most common handle being used for these hammers and reflexes. Uh, the rubber uh, they were using was actually the actual rubber, the, the like the plant rubber or the animal rubber that comes out, not silicon like we use right now or artificial rubber or plastic. Uh, and then, you know, they start adding these finesses where they will have extra tools to screw in, screw out. They will start using additional things that you can, uh, they started making it sharp, so you can do Babinski reflex all of it. But you all just will go to a tool maker and propose a model that they want. But the first really successful hammer was the Tomahawk hammer, the Am Armstrong hammer. And it was designed in a very specific way. It was lightweight, so you can carry it in your pocket and in small handle. But that means that to compensate for a light top and a small handle, you had to use it in very specifically. You have to use it with a full swing of your arm, and you have to have a double swing. Not only swing at your elbow and wrist, but also swing between your finger off the hammer. So there was, if, if the hammer stays steady, there was this swing happening at the wrist and elbow, but also the hammer was swinging. So what happens is that you swing it down, and then the swing between your fingers adds speed or momentum, 
So the speed or momentum tries to compensate for the weight, lack of weight of the head of the hammer. The alternate would be you wouldn't need a lot of swing if the weight was very heavy. You can make a very heavy hammer. But it was preferred to be carried around in pocket easily, you know, like these jacket pockets. You know, white coats was not very really common. But then you have to have a good swing. This is not a good rubber. So a good swing and a good rubber in a good design hammer should bounce the hammer back about the same height as the strike happens. So if the strike happens here, it should bounce back about as much as the strike is happening. And if the strike happens like this, it should bounce back, which it does not. So it's a very poor hammer because it has literally plastic at the end, not rubber. So it will not get a good strike. So it's a very, very bad hammer. And of course, you know, would be a bad swing too. In compared to the German hammer, the Tromner hammer, which was brought to US uh, by uh, from Germany by the founders of Mayo Clinic people and they went there and they loved these hammers so our Mayo Clinic hospital will have these hammers and I think they still carry this practice that this is their preferred hammer and it has a good rubber design, good heavy weight, longer arm so less swing is needed and you should you, and I have to actually stop the otherwise it will go out of my hand. You see how much of a bounce it has? So it comes all the way back. So the bounce of a good strike and a good rubber, good hammer design, should be equal to the amount of swing given. So if it's 180 degree swing, you should get 180 degree bounce back. Okay, if you don't stop. So that's a good design. And then you know you guys know about the two other common designs that are being used. The, the Queen Square hammer. This was being used by the Queen Square London Hospital, designed by them. It was designed to be more rounded, 360 use, so you don't have to have just one angle for strike. And the actual design, this is not the actual replica, Dr. Bertoni had one, would swing to the side so you can angle it so you can go into biceps more easily. This rounded was harder to get into the biceps with the arm folded. And then of course, last one that was used at Creighton for a long time, I don't know if still they have it or not, was the Bavinsky hammer, which is the French hammer, where the Joseph Bavinsky design, you know, he preferred this hammer uh, in the French hospital and they were using the Bavinsky hammer. And of course, it's heavier, but it has a bigger mallet and bigger rubber. Uh, um, for its advantages. But this gives you an idea of why these tools are designed a certain way, why we're doing the techniques in a certain way, what we're trying to get. So that's very important to be mindful of when you're doing a neurological examination, that it has a role, it has a purpose. It's not being done to build a patient or to get the checklist, but it's being done as a history of evolution behind it. And ask yourself, why am I doing it this way? If you don't know, then you should ask and then you should bring this question up and maybe we don't know, then we will all look it up and maybe nobody knows and so we say, well, just somebody make it, made it up this way. And if it did, if somebody made it up, then you can make your own up. Maybe yours will be better technique or more important or useful and then you can compare the two techniques and publish it. Okay? So with this background and introduction to neurological examination, uh, what we will do, so it's almost about one, uh, we will go through the neurological examination in segments. Um, we will break them into cranial nerves, uh, motor exam, uh, sensory and coordination exam, and reflexes. Uh, Dr. Bertoni will present uh, each section first, and then he will take a break. We will uh, then make small groups and practice. The senior residents will be teaching the junior residents, okay? So you guys can, um, where is the chief? Kyle? He just stepped up. So we'll ask Kyle to split you guys into four groups so that uh, we have four senior residents, right? Jemison, Kyle, Taha, mm -hmm. and Danny. Uh, Danny. Okay, so we will, we'll use the four seniors to <laughs> pair up with the juniors and practice exam and teach them the tips and tricks and we'll be walking around to give our tips. We'll then conclude with uh, you know anything left or any common tips and tricks and then we'll go on to the next section. Hopefully we'll take about half hour with each of them and have four of them. So in two hours we'll finish at three with the neurological examination. And then at the end of the day, before breaking up, I'm going to take another 20-30 minutes to talk about rounds, talk about general tools, what to carry. I will tell you my uh, ideas and plans. I'll show you my bag, what I used to carry. I have a different bag now, but all of this sits in the bag. I used to fit in my pockets and I used to carry them around and I'll show you what I had and then we'll uh, see if other senior residents have ideas on what they carry and found useful on the rounds with them. Um, if we have time, I will talk to you about the apps that I use on my phone that I found very useful. 
uh, in examining <coughs> patients, handful apps, and then of course we'll see if someone else have any app that they have found useful uh, for patient examination uh, in any shape or form that they want to share and hopefully we'll record all this information so that you can always refer back to it and see what was being taught today. Questions? Concerns? <coughs> no? Okay. So over to you, Dr. B. All right, thanks. We can stop and then...